All right, now my turn. Good morning. Good morning. Glad everybody's here this morning, even on a Memorial Day or Labor Day, I should say, Labor Day weekend. Always get those two confused. I don't know why. All right. So just as a kind of a warm up here and welcome, by the way, if you're a first time visitor or anything like that, we have been actually I've been thinking about it just as we got started here. Uh, we started like back in October, late October last year, uh, talking about the end times as Bible presents the account of what's going to happen. Um, it was sort of related to the October 7th invasion and, and kidnapping that happened uh, in Israel and all that happened there, um, just as a related, to, because lots of questions come up. How does that relate to the end times? And so started somewhat of a topical series on what does the Bible have to say on big overview on the end times. If we, were, we would still be studying that topic. We were trying to exhaustively look at every single thing the Bible has to say because it's a huge, huge topic. Um, but I always had planned, even before that October 7th invasion or anything else that happened with Israel, I always thought, well, the next exegetical study, verse-by-verse -verse study through a books of the Bible would be to go to First and Second Thessalonians, which happens to dovetail really nicely because the end times is talked about everywhere in Scripture, but no other epistles of the New Testament are so focused on the end times as are the two letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. So we kind of dovetailed into that. So for about 10 to 11 months, we've been kind of talking either directly or somewhat loosely about how Scripture defines what we're to be prepared for as we look towards the end times of all events. Um, and so we're at the very end of that because today will be the last day and we study, have a sermon series on the books of second, or First and Second Thessalonians, right? So this is chapter 3, the tail wrap-up of all of that. So We'll move on to the actual topics that Emily and Josh just talked about with the life groups in 2 Peter chapter 1 over there here in a couple weeks. So this is the, the wrap-up of all of that kind of fruit and work through the scriptures here over the last 10 to 11 months. And as is pretty typical in any epistle in the New Testament, certainly a Paul letter, is you see the very, very practical, how do I apply and what do you want me to do with the knowledge? It's good to get knowledge. And, of course, we, I think Scripture does encourage us, you know, right over there. It says, you know, knowledge, right? We're supposed to have knowledge in our walk with Christ. But we are also supposed to apply that in a way that really makes sense. Today's message will predominantly be about how we apply. What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you, Paul, what are you asking the church, specifically here at Thessalonian Church, what do you want us to do in relationship to all of these wonderful teachings that you have brought to us? And so we're going to look at this. Really, he talks about love. We need to excel in our love. We need to understand the importance of having patience while we wait for the Lord's return and to know that we have been accomplished in Christ a peace that is very, very unnatural because of the persecution that we could suffer even though we are enduring in patience, right? So if you just put these together, these three terms, we're, we're supposed to have love for God at all times and love for one another. We are to endure in patience because we don't know when the Lord is coming, but we do know that we want to be in him and with him when he does come. And even while we wait for that, we are to have an attitude and a heart of peace, not timidity, not fear about what's yet to come, but trusting with confidence and abundance what the Lord will accomplish for our peace as he comes. So, as I mentioned last week, if you were here, I've taken chapter 3, and I took, there was the first five verses, and I said, we'll get to those next week, that's today. And then we looked at the next grouping of verses from 6 to 17, and said, look, we're going to talk about that, because that was this whole practical, but it deals with, you know, if a man won't work, he won't eat, we need to have personal responsibility in the things that we are actually doing daily in our walk with Christ. And then we get now back to verses 16 through 18, where we actually talk about more of this application stuff. So with that in mind, grab your phones, grab your devices, grab your scriptures, or look on the screens. Here's that grouping of verses, 1 through 5, and then 18, or 16 through 18 as we look at the last chapter in 2 Thessalonians. Paul writes, Finally, brethren, pray for us, 
that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified, just as it is written, just as as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. And then jumping to verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. All right, so the first thing we take notice here in this grouping that I put together is that Paul requests prayer, okay? For him as an evangelist, Paul spreading, sharing the gospel of truth wherever he goes, he's asking for prayer. I, he's asking, look, without your prayers, I don't know that I'll be nearly as effective unless you, I've, been, I've got this undergirding, this foundation of prayer to go and evangelize the lost, right? And then we also want to pray for the lost, wouldn't it be great if our work in evangelism actually produced the fruit for the kingdom of God? So he's asking for prayer for me, for, speaking of Paul, me as an evangelist who goes out and travels and shares the gospel of Christ wherever God allows me to share that gospel, and then pray that it would be effective in actually bringing new converts, new believers into the kingdom. Now, as I've mentioned back in the study of our book of Hebrews and other things, Paul's the only apostle in the New Testament who writes a letter and actually requests prayer. He requests it here in in the Thessalonian church, 1 Thessalonians 2, Romans 15, Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, and of course Hebrews 13 as well. He's always asking for prayer so that he can be an effective minister of the gospel. So, isn't it interesting that one of the most bold and you know, very, very confident men who's out there constantly preaching the word of God doesn't feel equipped to do that work unless people are praying for him. So we should always consider praying for those, especially those that we know are going out onto the mission field, going into areas where we know that there is spiritual oppression or heaviness and or the lost need to hear the message and pray for them. Again, the message giver And, of course, the message receivers so that the kingdom will be built. Sharing the gospel with unbelievers is Paul's appointed first priority. That's what he was traveling the world to do. As long ago, we talked about Paul being one of the most traveled men in the ancient world. He traveled on three, at least three, we believe it's probably really four different missionary journeys where he is traveling thousands of miles at his own expense, mostly, to get from place to place to share the gospel wherever the Lord will allow him to go and share that. So with that, I thought, well, gosh, Paul says, pray for me that I can share the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. I thought, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we make sure that everybody here today is reminded of what the gospel actually is? Okay. As Paul himself defined it, and for those of you already know where we're going, we're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes this, For I delivered, talking to the Corinthians, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So the Gospel, please, If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, make sure you get these three points. This is what we're supposed to share with the world wherever we're called to share the gospel. Okay, That Christ died, it's reality, the Lord Jesus Christ died on that cross. Maybe even more important, for our sins. If we don't know that we're a sinner, we have no understanding of why Christ needed to die. The world thinks it's pretty good. The world thinks it's doing okay. The world thinks God is patting them on the back saying, well done, when in reality, all of our attempts at righteousness are filthy rags. And we need God to die for us in order for us to be in relationship to him. So Christ died for our sins, and of course, all according 
to the scriptures. There's no surprises here. The Christ ought to die. This is exactly what he told the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Ought not the Christ to have suffered and died and entered into his glory? I mean, ought not he died? Because he was starting at Moses and all the scriptures, he began to tell them how the Christ, the Messiah, must die. So point number one, please tuck this one away that Christ died for the sins of the world. He died for our sins. And it's all been recorded in advance of his death in the Old Testament. Second, he was buried. It's really important to know that the dead body of Jesus went into the tomb. He was buried. It was a testimony that his death was actually real. There's like 10 different, you know, uh, heretical theories out there. You know, the swoon theory, oh, he didn't really die. And there's the, oh, he had a twin that, you know, it just looked like him that nobody knew about. And that, you know, and all these, they stole the body, all these different conspiracies. The point is, Scripture reveals and historical information actually records that he was buried. He was in that tomb for three days. Okay. But... The great news, the thing that guarantees our understanding of our salvation and our eternal life with Christ is that he rose again on the third day, again, according to the scriptures. So I would really encourage you, if you haven't already highlighted it, highlight 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Take that list. Take the notes that you've been provided this morning. Make sure I know the gospel. When somebody says, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Or what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? We'll say the foundation is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and he rose again, and all of this has been recorded in Scripture hundreds of years, more than a thousand years before he actually went to the cross and suffered and died. So that's what Paul was going out to the world. I'm certain that every new town, every new ministry, every opportunity Paul had to preach the gospel, those three things were included. Jesus died for our sins, he was buried in a tomb, he rose again from that tomb the third day, as God has prophesied in the scriptures. So, can you apply that? I think you can. I think we need to make sure we understand that. So, as I said, most of today is application. Paul desired to see the gospel spread to the whole world so that it would glorify Jesus. Right? That's the whole point of getting the gospel out there. And he's asking for prayer. We should be doing the same thing. We should be praying for those that we know are going, and we should be praying for ourselves or asking for prayer for ourselves so that any time the Lord brings an opportunity to share the truth of Christ, we can share it with boldness so that the Lord is glorified. So believers will do well to obey all that the Scriptures have commanded us. This came up actually in our pastor's lunch this past Tuesday. Somebody reminded us of uh, Micah 6.8. It's probably a verse on your memory list somewhere if you do that kind of thing. Micah 6.8 is a wonderful verse. And it says, he has shown you, O man, that's all of us, right? He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord or Yahweh, what does Yahweh require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And we were talking about this with, you know, 15, 20 pastors in the room. We were just kind of wrestling through the meanings of some of these things. But it, to me, it was so very clear as we were talking about this. What does the world do today? What step in these three things says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, right? What's the step that gets skipped? Justly, firstly off, Right? People want to just give forgiveness. Oh, it's okay that you feel this way. It's okay that you commit that sin. It's okay. We want to show mercy without telling somebody the standard that has been violated. We don't want to hold them accountable, or we don't want ourselves to be held accountable for what we do wrong. Right? Oh, just give me mercy. Oh, yeah, I I, I, you know went past that cop 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. Just show mercy, right? But ignore the standard, just show mercy. Or anything else that we do, we want, the world says, ah, just give me mercy. But what's it so important, and it, uh, this goes right back to what I was just saying. Okay. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died for what? Our sins. Justly. Right? Our sins are unjust. Our sins have borne the punishment, should bear the punishment of eternal damnation because one single sin separates us from God. All sin separates us from God. 
So we need to know that standard of what is just, what is right, what is holy, what does God require. Now that we know it, we can then have an attitude of, Lord, I need forgiveness, or I'm looking for mercy, getting a blessing from God that I don't deserve, or a result of saying, I deserve to be punished, but will you relent from that punishment? And then once we have done those two things, acknowledged our violation of God's justice and sought his way, his solution for mercy, then the next thing we're supposed to do is walk humbly with our God. Why? Because I can't save myself. My sins separate me from God. All of our sins separate us from God. So if he's willing to tell us the standard, willing to remind us that he has died for our sins, then we have to have an attitude of walking humbly with God. This is really what Paul is saying all through this letter, is to learn how to walk humbly with God. And that is an important aspect of our sanctification. Remember we've talked about sanctification? This whole process of sanctification is being more reflective, a life more lived in submission and obedience to Christ. That is submission. That is sanctification. And we are called to do that. May the Lord direct your hearts in the love of God is the next phrase that he says. May the Lord direct your hearts in the love of God. Hearts is a big, big topic. And as I said, this is all about application. So I want all of us to internalize this and talk about the importance of having a heart that is right with God, that God is establishing it. Because everything, it all begins with the heart. Everything in your thought life, everything in your actions, whether good or bad, everything in our relationship to God, it all begins with what's going on in our heart. And of course, you know, we say heart, not necessarily talking about the beating organ in our chest, but it's, you know, without that beating organ in our chest, we can't do anything. But it's that, what is it, the volition, our own will, what is our desires, what is the internal soul, if you will, what is it doing? Well, I just want to read, I won't give you all the scriptures here, but let me just walk you through what, how important the heart is. And then the, the application, or what you need to do with this is gauge your heart, how you doing in these things. He's, Jesus, in a Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How's your heart? Are we in purity, or is our heart impure in relationship to what God is requiring of us? Boy, we could stop there, I suppose. How's our heart doing in purity? Are the things we're looking at, the things we're speaking, the things we do, the way we conduct our life, is it in purity of heart? Because the pure in heart shall see God. So we ought to be seeking a pure heart when we walk with God. He also says in the same Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 28, looking at lust with, uh, is an adultery, is a violation of the marriage law. Looking with lust in the heart, you don't have to actually do it. You don't actually have to engage in fornication or adultery or any of these kind of sexual sins. If it's in the heart, you've already got a problem because you've already violated the purity of the heart by looking with lust in a different direction. I'll just leave that for now. Jesus says, uh, still in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, whatever the heart values is what man treasures. So wherever your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Right? The things that we treasure, there's our heart. So we've got to look at our life and say, what am I putting my time and energy and money and focus and what am I doing? There's where my, that's a reflection of where my heart is. So the heart is the beginning of our walk with God. It's got to be listening to, surrendered to, and walking with God. And we start getting more negative on these, or a little bit even more negative. The mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. Whatever we speak to our spouse, to our children, to our parents, to our coworkers, to our boss, to our pastor, whatever it is, whatever's coming out, you know, whether we kind of thought about it beforehand or it just came flying out of our mouth, that's where our heart is. Our heart is speaking truth, whether we process that or not. It's usually, um, and as I mentioned before, when you hit your 
thumb with a hammer or you get cut off in traffic or your spouse says something that was just like a trigger moment for you, whatever that next response is, that thing has always been in our hearts. It just needed a trigger to pop out. And so we need to make sure our hearts start to have the right triggers, the right responses, the right kind of response. So we've got to have an evaluation of how our heart is doing. Because it then, evil proceeds out of the heart. I would, because of scripture, because of the authority of scripture, I can say this. Every wicked, evil, disgusting, horrible thing that's ever been done on this planet started as a motivation of the heart before it became an action or a word. Every single one of those things from all of history has always been a heart first and then the body, the mouth, whatever responds to what the heart wants to do. I want to kill my enemies. I want to commit some kind of heinous crime against another person. I want to do some kind of wicked thing. It all starts with the heart. So we've got to watch our hearts. Believing scripture as the absolute standard or the absolute truth or not believing it is a matter of the heart. So when we turn to Genesis 1-1 and it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, believing that statement or rejecting that statement is a matter of the heart. The truth is written. God has given us the truth. If we accept it, it's a matter of, oh, I agree with what God says. If I reject it, Oh, it's a matter of what my heart is responding to in terms of what the scripture says. Or the same thing. We go back to what we looked at with 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He's buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you believe that, that's a heart issue. And if the world is rejecting those truth claims from scripture, it's a heart issue. It all begins in where the heart is at in the midst of all these things. So we, if you're having any trouble with what this book says about any topic, whether it's cultural or social or scientific or theological, if you're having trouble with what the book says, know that your trouble started with your heart because it refused to accept the truth as presented to us by Scripture. I just wanted to go ahead and point this one out from Luke 24. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Where did Christ point to the problem? Oh, he said, O foolish ones, where did the foolishness come from? Slow of heart to believe in what the prophets or the scriptures have spoken. So that comes directly from Jesus. A saving confession of faith in Christ must come out of our hearts. If we're going to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, for eternal life, that's also got to be a heart decision. And that's a good one. That's a great thing to do, but it's got to come out of our heart. If we only think of it in our head, we only say the words, we only come to church because everybody else is doing it, but our heart isn't in Christ, then we don't have salvation. And that's something we need to check. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Again, good memory verses for everybody. If you confess with your mouth and you, the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth then this confession is made for salvation. The heart is the start. The heart is the beginning. The heart is the core issue that needs to be addressed when we're talking about how do I apply all the truths of Scripture. We either have it from the heart or we are rejecting something God has planned for us, again, from our hearts. And this ought to scare us, having gone through what I just gave you as a list of heart issues. God will test every heart for obedience and for faith. We looked at that in 1 Thessalonians 2.4. In fact, here it is. Paul wrote this earlier in the letters to the epistle here. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as to pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Oh, we are, we're, we have a test. I mean, I'm, most, some of you probably are love test taking. 
You know, oh, I can't wait to go take that test and get, be the first one done in class and get the 100%, and I love taking tests. Anybody in that category, you know, love it? Uh, I figured my daughter would be. Um, <laughs> others, we hear, oh, it's test day, and we're like, oh, no. Or, hey, it's time to go parallel park test with the DMV or whatever, you know. Oh, I don't want to take the test, right? Or we get test anxiety. Well, Every single human being on the planet has an appointed test that is coming. God is going to test the hearts as to whether or not we actually trusted in him, we actually are obeying him. God is going to test the hearts. That's what will determine where we go and where we don't go. But I want every person in this room to be a bold and confident test taker on that test. Be bold in it. I trust in the Lord. I trust in his word. I trust in his salvation. Lord, I'm ready for that test. If that test comes today, I want to pass it. If that test comes in 20 years, I want to live a life the next 20 years to pass that test. Whatever that time frame may be, be ready for the test because God will, in fact, test every heart as to whether or not it trusted in him and it's pleasing to him because of our faith and obedience. Oh, I love this one from... Hebrews 3 says it multiple times, but today, if you will hear his heart or hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, today's the day we don't harden our heart. Every single day is the day that we don't harden our hearts. Because any one of us can go from a t- soft, tender heart toward God, toward a, you know, a stiff arm and a walking away, an apostasy or whatever we want to call it, we can walk away from God and say, I'm, not, I'm tired of that today. But the scripture says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So when do we not want to harden our hearts? Today. Every day is today in that. There's no history. It's all today. We want to have hearts that are soft and ready to hear the Lord, not ones that are hard and not listening. The greatest commandment, love, you know this. If you know much about any scripture, you probably know this from Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37. When, he's, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says from the Old Testament, and you probably know it, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Where did he start? With all your heart. Our heart has been instructed by the creator and sustainer and savior of this planet and every person on it to love the Lord your God with all of our heart. That's how we pass the test that we just talked about. Nothing else matters because without love for God and love for others, we don't have a relationship with God, the kind that he wants us to have. I know we've been going on. I know, I mean, tomorrow's a holiday, so we're just going to go. No. Um, I do, uh, chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians is a really short chapter, and as we're talking about the importance of having a heart and loving God with all of our heart, I want to read the whole chapter. I want you to really think about this as it applies to us. First, in our relationship to our Father in Heaven and His Son and the Holy Spirit, and then also how we're doing with others. But listen to what Paul says here from Verse 1, all the way through the end of chapter 13. Paul writes, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Or whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. 
But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Do you hear what Paul is saying? Do you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying? We need to have hearts that are completely sold out for God. And we, when we are sold out for God, then we ought to be able to show God's love to the world that we live in, in our families, in our relationships, in our you know, comings and goings with strangers even. We ought to be able to show the love of God, that we have this love for him always, love our strangers, love our neighbors as ourself, as we are instructed to do. So it all begins with the heart. We need to do a heart check, a heart test regularly, daily. How's my heart? Is it loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, body, and strength, or mind? And then he also says, and love our neighbors as ourself. How am I doing with that? And we ought to recognize that faith, hope, and love are super important. But if I have not love, my faith, Paul just said, my faith doesn't really affect it. Why? Because if I have if I have faith without love, something's broken. If I have hope in the future, but I don't have love, my, my hope in the future is really false. I've got to have love, that foundation that God has appointed for me to have. All right. So, now, the next component that Paul says here is, May the Lord also direct your hearts in the, to the patience of Christ. That's endurance, that's long-suffering, that's enduring in faith and love all the way to the end of all that's happening here. Again, I want to give you just a couple of points here. The Greek word for, or for perseverance here or patience is hupomone, and it means to persevere, meaning in faith, when facing severe persecution. I've mentioned so many times in the study this church is under intense, extreme, severe persecution. It's coming daily. It's coming regularly. Their life is not what it could be if they just walked away from Christ. But being in Christ, they're under severe persecution. And so we're persevering through it with love, with faith, persevering all the way through. That's what Paul's instructing them to do. Have patience, endurance that perseveres all the way through to the end. It also means to remain under, to be under the authority of Christ and to not under the authority of the ruler, let's say it's Satan, the ruler of this age. Satan never wants to give you up. Now, Satan will, I, and I was just listening to a pastor this morning in my preparations for, not preparations, but my daily routine getting ready, listening to some other sermons that I like. And he was talking about how Satan will be w more than willing if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in Christ, he might just not have all that much factor in your life. But if you make a profession of faith in Christ, you're target number one. He wants to destroy you. He wants to come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's, if he's already killed you, he's already destroyed you, he doesn't really need to do much more work with you. But if you're in Christ, we should expect persecution from the wicked one, from the evil one, from the ruler of this age. So we don't want to remain under his authority. We escaped his authority when we made a profession of faith in Christ. We came out from the ruler of this age and we came in and out of the ruler of the darkness and into the glorious light of God. But when we say, ah, well, you know, if life is really hard, I think maybe this Christian thing, this going to church thing, this reading the scriptures thing, this faith thing hasn't really gained me anything, so I'm going to go back under the ruler of the darkness and the ruler of this age. No, stay under Christ's authority and escape continually the authority of of the, uh, the wicked one, of Satan. Bear up under. It means you know, to bear un up under Christ. Bear under him, even while all those fiery arrows are fired at you. Satan will launch fiery ar arrows and darts, but we are instructed to hold up a shield, right, to, with which we may be able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. What is that shield? It's the shield of faith, along with the other spiritual warfare elements there in 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Endurance, enduring in all circumstances which could potentially separate us from faith. Endure, don't give up, keep going, endure in faith. Okay. Because we have a blessed hope in Jesus Christ. That patience leads us to the greatest, maybe two word or whatever you want to call it, phrase, single word in Greek, uh, in the New Testament, the blessed hope. The blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? Our reunion, our coming to face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. The blessed hope that we have. It will get us through all that this world throws at us. It will get us through everything Satan tries to steal, kill, and destroy us with. Our blessed hope, knowing that we will be united with Christ when he comes. For most of us, that'll be when we, this tent perishes and we breathe our last breath. For some, whenever that time comes, that harpazo will take place and we will join him in the air. Okay. But the blessed hope is when Christ comes. And I want to, just because this is our last study, I want to go through a couple of these charts that you've seen if you've been here several times over the course of the last 10 months. You've seen these charts, okay? And I just want to walk really quickly through these things. That we had this prophecy. First off, Daniel chapter 2, we had this golden man. He was standing upright, but from a timeline perspective, I laid him down. We had Babylon, we had Medo-Persia, we had uh, the, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, iron, and then at the bottom, iron mixed with clay. And you know what? This was 500 years before Christ, and we are all the way down here, not to the iron. Rome is gone, kind of. But now we've got these ten toes. We've, we're, everybody's looking for what are the ten nation states that will be in action when all this stuff starts to unfold. Well, clay represents people, right? Du you're made of the dust of the earth, clay. And by the time we get to the very end, there's going to be 10 toes. Well, look how far we've come. 500 years before Christ, all these things have taken place. And we're, we're just like right here in terms of revealed or unveiled prophecy to us. Did the same thing here. Remember that this got this church age. And this is the blessed hope. This is what we're looking for, this harpazo, this taking the church out of here before the horrible wrath events start to take place as described in Revelation. And we also, as we look at forward in time, look at also we went through these. Good view, I believe, of the seven churches of Revelation. And these churches, their, their effect on the kingdom of God is diminished. We're all the way down here. We're right here. You see, I keep pointing to the very edge of the screen. Not because I don't know where we are, but because that's where scripture stops talking about new things. We're down all the way down waiting for that event. Okay. Another one. We've got this, this unknown gap of called the church age and all these things that are part of it, including pers persecution, perseverance, all the stuff we're supposed to do. But then, as we talked about in 2 Thessalonians 2, the restrainer will be removed, and that means the harpazo has taken place, and then the great tribulation begins to unfold. Okay. That's the blessed hope that we've been waiting for. So whatever your view on all this is, know that Scripture tells us to persevere so that we get to whatever the end of this is. If we get there, if we're, if we're the generation that will see the harpazo, fantastic. If we're not, Guess what? We are still living a life of living for Christ, having hearts that are ready to be tested by God, and to be ready for his coming or our meeting him when we discard this tent that we have. All right. Scripture equips believers. How do we get this patience, this perseverance? How do we get it? Through the Scripture. Okay. Paul says in Romans 15, 4, one of these wonderful verses, Paul writes, for whatever things were written before, for us, that's everything, but for when Paul wrote it, it was mostly the Old Testament, whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That hope is very similar to the blessed hope in Christ that's yet to come. All right, we're wrapping up with this. Now may the Lord of peace, Paul says, Give you peace always in every way. Remember, this church is under persecution. Now, Paul did not pray, as we talked about a few chapters ago, Paul didn't pray that the persecution would end. 
Paul prayed that they would have peace even though the persecution probably wouldn't end. Now, how do you do that? If you and I are under intense persecution regularly, daily, it's just a battle every single day, Satan's throwing all he's got at us, anybody else who in the, in the flesh is throwing all they have at us, they're trying to steal our jobs, they're trying to steal our money, they're trying to steal our relationships, they're trying to tear everything that we love and respect down, we're still supposed to have peace. Hmm. Is that possible? I think it is. Paul thought it was. Have peace, meaning having tranquility in all circumstances. Meaning you and I are instructed to trust God at all times, never trust man. Whenever man is in a contradiction with God. Right? So we trust God. What did, what did Paul say? Be ready for the blessed hope. Paul said, don't worry, you are not appointed to wrath. Paul told him all these things that we are called to understand. Hold in that. We talked about this forgery, how people had started to write letters and say that Paul got things wrong. And Paul says, you've got to trust in the word. That's what gives us our hope. Knowing that God has us, knowing that God will always give us a way of escape when we are tempted by sin, and he will persevere with us, even if he doesn't deliver us, he will persevere with us through every trial, every tribulation, every struggle, everything that goes awry in this world, we can hold firmly on to Jesus Christ because we know that he is the one who has accomplished our peace and has given us hope. Be assured of having safety in Christ even if persecution comes. You have safety in Christ. Your position, my position in Jesus Christ, if our heart is ready to be tested... It doesn't matter if they nail me to a cross. It doesn't matter if they burn me at the stake. It doesn't matter if they throw me in the lion's den. It doesn't matter if they throw me into prison. What matters is I have faith in Christ. How many of us truly have that attitude that it doesn't matter what this world throws at me, I'm willing to stand for Christ? If you say, boy, that sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm too comfortable in my 24th or 21st century American lifestyle know that we have forefathers in the church who refused to do the easy, simplest things to save their life and said, no, I won't deny my Lord. They walked through. There, it was a requirement for anybody who wanted to you know, be unpersecuted. All the person had to do was take a pinch of incense, cast it before Caesar or some fire that represented Caesar, and say, hail Caesar, and they could go about their life for the rest of the year. That was it. Take a pinch, throw it to Caesar, and be done. If you failed to do that, you got thrown, whatever, in the lion's den or burned at the stake. We look at life and say, ah, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be too disrupted for my life. I don't want to be too persecuted. And so we just kind of hide and we deny Christ and we don't tell people. This is not the life of our ancestors in the church who came before us. They were willing to boldly proclaim Christ, and never, ever compromise the truth of who he is, even to a world that hated them and persecuted them any, at any moment in time. Don't be at war with God, but be willing to go to war for God. Hmm. Don't be at war with God. Surrender to him, obey him, listen to him, follow him, trust him. Trust his word, but don't go to battle with God. Don't go to war with God. How foolish is that? Read Psalm 2. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh for their foolishness of thinking they could defeat the God of the universe. Don't go to war with God, but be willing to go to war for God wherever he calls us. And lastly, maintain harmonious relationships with God other believers, and with all others as much as possible. This is what Paul is instructing the church. Be in a good relationship with God. Never compromise that. As much as depends on us, let's be in good relationships with all other believers. That's really good and important to do. And then even to a world that is, has enmity, has hatred, is vile in their presentation of hatred towards us because we're Christians. 
as much as possible, be at peace. But as I said, trust God, not man. Be at peace with God. And if it means being at war with those around you by saying, I won't compromise, then be at peace with God and at war with man if God calls us to be powerfully rejecting or resisting what the, sat- what the world and Satan tries to throw at us. These are all, I don't know if you catch it, again, these are all action steps. These are, I'll put these into practice now. What are we called to do? We are called to examine our hearts, get them ready for God's testing, persevere in all things, don't look at the circumstances of life, look at the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and trust in God's word, because it's our greatest connection to knowing him, serving him, and obeying him, is to look at his word and say, I trust in your word. Jesus said in John 17, 17, you sanctify your church by your word. Your word is truth. Sanctify your word. Sanctify your people by this word. Trust in God. Trust in his word. Love God. Love others. And be ready for the test that is upon us. It could come today. Let's be ready for it. Amen. Father God, we love you uh, as always, and we want to thank you for the blessed hope that we have to look forward to, meeting you face to face, Lord God, living a life where we cast aside this mortal, sinful tent that we walked in this building with again today, Lord, and being un- having a great understanding that you will give us a glorified presence with you for eternity if we simply examine our hearts, confess out of our hearts and with our lips, Lord God, that you are indeed Lord, Savior, and God, and that we want to be in relationship with you. Lord, help us to practically apply everything that your word has instructed us. There's no list of one or two or 10 or 20 or 50 things, Lord God. It's a constant knowledge that your word reveals of how to live our lives. And we need to take each piece day by day and be more and more conformed into your image. So, Lord, that can only happen if we surrender our hearts to your Holy Spirit who guides us and leads us in truth and guides us into a sanctified life that we follow you. And I pray that each and every one of us who have made a confession of faith in Christ will, in fact, persevere with hope all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we have prayer teams up front. Love to have you come up, receive prayer for anything that you have need over. And have a wonderful, blessed day.